Greetings, Creepy Readers. The fourth episode of the Creepy Reader Podcast begins in three, two, one. Well, hello there, Creepy Readers. It's me, your host, Coffin J, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Creepy Reader Podcast, the literary horror show made and named just for you. Today, we will be discussing James Murr, Murray, and Darren Wormouth's arachnophobic tale, Don't Move. But first, Bienvenidos a mi creepy compadre, Zombie Zack. Hola, Zombie Zack. Happy New Year to you, my friend. Welcome back to the Creepy Reader Podcast. Happy New Year's and uh, hope you had happy holidays, all of you out there. Yeah, man. Did you? So I, before we go into any book stuff, we got to talk about the New Year, man, New Year's resolutions. Um, and I specifically want to talk a little bit about like tattoos and tattoo ideas. Um, I think that you have some on the horizon. So I thought maybe we could share some of that. Uh, so let's start with you, my buddy. What's going on with you? What are your, I think I have an idea of what some of your resolutions are, but please share that with us. We would love to know. Okay. So my first resolution is I think the one I'm most committed to and I'm just going really well. And it's just to drink only water. Like water is the drink all year long. Uh, try to get myself off caffeine and sodas and all kinds of different shit that I drink all the time. And then I think I'll maybe start reintroducing stuff back. It's a bit of a control thing more than anything. So I was really letting myself go. I was drinking, I don't know, maybe f- low end two, high end, like six to eight espresso shots. Oh, with- I thought you were going to say sodas, dude. I was going to punch you in the throat. I'm like, dude, sodas that many? No, but I was still doing like one, you know what I mean? I would still do like a soda every day. I was buying the mini cans uh. for a while just to do one a day. <laughs> right. Which was helpful, but I was like, why am I That's even a great doing illusion. this? Why am I even doing this? <laughs> you know what I mean? True. Honestly, bro, you really shouldn't drink anything but water. Why are you trying to cut out? Are you just trying to cut out caffeine because you, it had such a big hold on you for so long with your... Dude, I went... when I You have a great espresso machine, first of all. The espresso mm. shots are clean and they're so friggin' good. Um, so I understand why you might be attracted to that. But you got to the point, you were telling me, like, dude, I had like four espresso shots before work and I don't even feel a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, number one, it's not helping me. And I do that with anything. Like, uh, once I get to a point where I'm like, this is not bringing me the high it once did, you know what I mean? I need to kind of stop and put it down for a bit. And always my, you know, my natural tendency is to be an addict. So it's like, <laughs> I will always, don't worry, I will definitely think about this. You know what I mean? I don't know about you, dude, but I get pretty winded after a good long flight of stairs. Remember that production where we had to carry all that shit up the stairs? Dude, I was pretty skinny when we did that. And I was still like, I mean, huffing, (laughs) more like hoofing, dude. I was like, (gasps) it was really bad. That's my least favorite part about production. Remember, we scheduled 15 minutes to come down because we we both knew we'd breathe like that if we had to walk up one flight of stairs. We just didn't know it was 12. I know. I was so glad when that guy offered to help. We were like, yes, you're a saint. (laughs) Do you want hand jobs? I think a lot of people are like resolutions. Obviously, they want to be healthier. I'm on the same train, dude. I'm my roller coaster of like gain weight, lose weight, gain weight, lose weight is way more dramatic than yours. I feel like like I'm like, dude, I will flip flop like 70 pounds. I lost set like 70 pounds last year and I'm already up like 30 pounds from that. Well, then I dropped four. So 26 pounds, but I was 10, like 10 pounds away from my goal weight before that. So if I can get back on track and I can lose like 40 pounds and I'll be at my total go weight, probably have like at least a four pack. So you see my new tattoo. So every, so everybody knows I just recently got a new tattoo a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's the whole entire length of my forearm and it's basically like a, a medieval castle, uh, kind of on a hill with some clouds and there's a couple birds there and maybe I'll post a picture of it on Instagram, but I plan on kind of finishing out this kind of half sleeve at least this year. And then I want to get the other half sleeve in my other arm upper part of my other arm kind of redone uh, and colored and better. What's on your tattoo horizon there, Boo? Um, I have a tattoo to commemorate my son coming up, uh, hopefully this year, but it kind of just depends on the finances of it. And then uh, there'll be a new tattoo idea once the new baby's here. And then I think I, once I get those three tattoos, I'll have enough to uh, on my, on my right arm to get totally full, fill with like, 
all kinds of little fill tattoos. You know what I'm talking about? So like sometimes you'll see stars and stuff. You're not going to leave any space, man. I hate those little dinky tattoos in between, dude. Like you should leave, leave the skin, man. That's a classic like sailor tattoo, Ahoy. vintage tattoo, or what do you call it? A traditional tattoo look, man. Well, I was hoping I'm not going to do it with a pattern, though. So like you're thinking of like one pattern, one cohesive pattern. I just want to go to my guy and be like, hey, can we bust out 20 of these like really small like traditional style tattoos can one of them be a little sperm that looks like asher <laughs> yeah one of them can be a little squirt of sperm <laughs> <laughs> okay perfect <laughs> hey if you needed a sperm to trace i can provide the sperm beyond our happy new year i think we should go ahead and move on to our creepy facts there buddy would you like to go first or second this week uh you know what i think i should go first Oh, okay. Well, have at it, buddy. So my creepy fact this week is that the catacombs of Paris, um, which are underground ossuaries, uh, I kind of think of it as like a, a grid-like system, and it's got like all these different patterns and tunnels you can take. Uh, it holds the remains of more than 6 million people. Jesus Christ. So I find that totally insane. And there are even like, there are bodies of people who get lost in the catacombs and start like die. And they will be found like literally 20 years later. So they'll just be like sometimes randomly like newer dead bodies in the catacombs. And it's uh, apparently kind of common for that to happen because it's such a tourist spot and there's so many of them and they're so big. There's no way to like always be guarding them. Jesus Christ. So dude, I looked it up and six million bodies, dude, that's almost that's like double the population of Chicago. That's only two and a half million less than the population of New York as it currently stands in 2021. That's post COVID, everybody. Well, I don't know, post COVID. There's like there's new like variations coming out all the time, but dude, that's insane. So do they know like what the period of time those bodies were collected over? Like, was it over thousands of years, hundreds of years, a decade, decades? Um, I was reading, let's see here. No, I haven't read too much about it. I know, remember reading about it one time, but I don't remember what it said, unfortunately. So I was, I, I haven't come as prepared creepy readers and I apologize for that. Bury me, if you will. I'm a zombie. I'll rise again. From the grave I rise. Or maybe you won't. You know, we'll figure out whatever the hell it is keeps bringing you back, and we'll just lay that bitch to rest. It'll be like the tablet of Amon Ra. We're going to de Amon Ra your ass. Okay, so my creepy fact is, um, well, I, again, I think the title speaks for itself. The heir to Jameson Whiskey bought a child to feed to cannibals. Yes. In 1888, James Jameson, the heir to the Jameson Whiskey Empire, was on an expedition in a trading post in the Belgian colony of Congo, which he had been told was inhabited by cannibals. Uh, Jameson was interested in seeing the practice up close. So a Sudanese translator named Assad Faran, uh, who was on the trip, later recalled that Jameson bought a 10-year-old enslaved girl for the sole purpose of watching her be killed and eaten. The girl was tied to a tree, Franz's account of the incident stated. The natives sharpened their knives a while, then one of them, then stabbed her twice in the belly. Whew, which for Zach and I right now probably wouldn't penetrate to any important organs, but I digress. Um, the girl was murdered while Jameson allegedly sat and drew sketches of the incident. Uh, Jameson's family, uh, with the help of the Belgian government, managed to keep the incident hush-hush. And Jameson never denied that it took place and uh, he died before he could face any sort of justice. So, Zach, you have a little bit of an affinity for alcoholic eggnog around the holidays. Uh, have you have you drank Jameson whiskey, alcoholic eggnog? Uh, yeah, I actually started on Jameson. That's where it kind of became like a yearly. I bought that during the holidays. And then I've moved to uh, E&J eggnog brandy now, which is a little bit smoother. I mean, whiskey, you really get that whiskey kick at the end of it. Okay, but how old is your daughter? My daughter's about to be 12 years old. So just two years away from 10 years old, right? So what you're saying is that for a couple of years, you basically endorsed the product of somebody who was basically willing to sell your daughter for a bunch of natives to kill and eat her. Is this what you're supporting, Zach? That's correct. I won't, I won't, I actually won't lie to you on this. If I had heard that fact before, I probably would have started with the E&Js because that's usually they're a little like right next to each other. 
and I bought Jameson for the brand, and I'm not going to associate that name with good things now. But I would have liked more details. Was it cooked over a fire, hot coals, cooked in a stew? Like, I want some details. Uh, either way, I again, once again, I digress. Um, creepy readers, I, I think it's time that we go ahead and we, we get into the book talk. So strap on your hiking boots, grab your flashlights, not flashlights, and let us delicately embark into the web-infested eight-legged nightmare that is James Murray and Darren Wormouth's Don't Move. Megan Forrester has barely survived the unthinkable. Six months ago, she witnessed a horrific accident that killed her husband and son, and lives with the guilt of knowing she could have done more to save them. Now, Megan hopes to mend the pieces of her broken spirit by attending a local church group's annual camping trip. But the church group's members, riddled with dark secrets of their own, make a catastrophic navigational mistake, leaving them stranded in an untouched canyon in the West Virginia National Forest. Isolated from any chance of help or rescue, Megan and the others quickly realize why the side of the canyon has never been surveyed by mankind. It's home to a terrifying prehistoric arachnid that patiently stalks its prey through even the slightest movement or vibration in the forest. And it's desperate for a meal. Grief-stricken and haunted by her tragic loss, Megan now faces her ultimate test of endurance. Can she outwit a bloodthirsty creature hell-bent on ensuring that no one gets out alive? When a single wrong turn can mean death, she only has one option. Don't move. Ooh, spooky. So, Zombie Zach, what are your thoughts based on the back of the book? Um, okay, so feels an interesting backstory with Megan Forrester. I'm assuming the backstory should have something to do with how she defeats this giant arachnid. And then it gives me a little bit of like spidery uh, Tremors vibes. So really like that. That sounds a lot of Tremors fun. wasn't spiders, just so you know. <clears throat> no, I know, but like the spider, uh, you know what I mean? No, I got the spider version of that. Yeah, no, I gotcha. Um, honestly, I, this really is, it's a creature feature book. You know, it kind of really goes back to these classic horror um ideas and, and uh, plots of like the early, like the fifties, like the forties and fifties, things like the fly and stuff like that. It's really kind of in that vein, you know? Um, so I did really enjoy that. And not only that, but this book has a really, really cool cover. Um, I do have a reel on Instagram that I did a while back if you guys want to check it out, but basically it's black with um, this webbing kind of all over it and it's textured and then it's got orange, like don't move. And then it has the author's name, but the whole thing when you shine a black light on it is uh, glow in the dark. So it's like really cool. The book itself, the cover is kind of a novelty. I really bought it based on the cover. Um, at, at, at the point that I bought this, I hadn't read any books by James Mur Murray uh, or Darren Wormouth, so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was like, this is a badass cover. So if you guys want to see the cover in action, head over to my Instagram reels and give it a check. Uh, you know, just give it a look. Um, but uh, do, have you seen the cover? You've seen, you remember the reel I'm talking about, right? Such a good one. Honestly, probably one of the coolest book titles I feel like you've done in, in your whole real list. Obviously, you know, I don't know if it's that much of a classic, but looks amazing. Looks really, really cool. Great premise. Oh, yeah. Looks super cool. And I just hate spiders. So, um, now, as always, we do like to delve into a little bit of facts about the author. Um, and we, in this case, we have two authors. Um, so we'll start with James S. Murray. Um, so James Murray is a writer, executive producer, and actor, best known as Murr on the hit television show Impractical Jokers, along with his comedy troupe, The Tenderloins. He has worked as the senior, uh, I wrote ICE president, but it's vice president of development for North South Productions for a decade and is the owner of Impractical Productions, LLC. He recently starred in Impractical Jokers, the movie, and also appears alongside the rest of The Tenderloins and Jamila Jamil in the television series, The Misery Index on TBS. Uh, he's the author of the international bestselling novels awakened the brink obliteration and stowaway uh so who knew that Murr from impractical jokers wrote horror books i bet you there's so many people who don't know that i bet you there's a lot of people who do too and they're like he's pretty damn good yeah yeah so i, I guess it's kind of a, a a love of his um from an early age and i'll kind of share my quick little story so last time i visited zach in kansas city uh there was a comic con and Murr was there so i went for the sole purpose of getting my book signed um so i met him super cool guy like he was like 
you know, the, everyone sits behind a table at the Comic Con and they just sign their stuff. He was like out in the front, hugging people, shaking their hand. Like he pulled out his idea of, from when he didn't have any eyebrows and he was showing everybody, um, taking pictures, you know, doing videos for people. Like pretty much the best celebrity interaction that you could you could ask for, uh, and kind of the you know I, I I was one of only a few people who actually had him sign the book. They were there for him or Practical Jokers. I was there for the book. Um, not that I don't like Practical Jokers, uh, but um, you know he's like, have you actually read any of my books? And I said, well, I'm working on Stowaway right now, which was the first one of his that I read. And he's like, very cool. You know, what do you think? And I was like, it's honestly it's pretty brutal. And he's like, that's what I like to hear. Um, so we had a nice little laugh, and obviously it was a quick interaction, but pretty cool, pretty cool guy. Um, and then you saw you saw them live right and the 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 jokers so the tenderloins which is their uh comedy troupe kind of thing um very funny obviously great demeanor on all those guys i was already a big fan of the show when i went there so a uh, great show if they're ever coming live you're you're not gonna be disappointed by going Oh, for sure. And did you know, so, and I've noticed this, I've read two of the books now, Stowaway and Now Don't Move, and Murr pays homage or, or homage, however you want to say it, uh, to basically Impractical Jokers and all his books. So I'll give you an example. In Stowaway, um, the passengers were having like a belly flop contest, like super similar to the one that Joe participated in in that one episode, <laughs> which is so <laughs> stupid. Dude, honestly, the show hasn't been the same since Joe left, but uh, we don't need to talk about that. And actually, if people want to see Stowaway, that you have a reel on that right next to... Uh, don't move. Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. And that was a pretty cool reel too. Um, and if you watch it, it basically it, like, it's like, that is like the book in, in a reel. Um, and then also in don't move, he literally has a character say something to the effect of like, who do you think you are? One of those impractical jokers. So his references are, are pretty shameless. Uh, Darren Wearmouth spent six years in the British Army before pursuing a career in corporate technology. After 15 years working for multinational firms and a startup, uh, he decided to follow his passion for writing. He's the author of numerous best-selling novels, including Awakened, uh, First Activation, and Critical Dawn. He lives in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, and the funny thing, uh, and I saw this in an episode, um, I think it was Joe, he said something to the effect of, of like, they had to answer questions 100% honest, and they were like, Murr, have you ever written a book 100% by yourself? And he certainly, he was like, no, and he just seemed so ashamed, and it was something that I related to so hard, you know? <laughs> it was like he couldn't get it done without his writing partner, so I feel like maybe maybe we owe this guy a lot <laughs> in terms of the book. <laughs> So before we move on to our first favorite or my first favorite quote, I just want to preclude, like, preclude the section by saying that Darren Wormouth and Murr love fucking killing children. Dude, these people are brutal as fuck. They will kill children. They do not care and they will do it brutally. Um, I'll give you an example. In the other book that I read, The Stowaway, they have a character named Wyatt Butler who's really like a very Freddy Krueger-esque. <laughs> Like he's a child murderer and he's just evil, dude. He's one of the worst people I've ever read in literature. And like, he, they just don't shy away from talking about him murdering the children and all the terrible things he did. And just it, 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 honestly, they, they don't fuck around. Um, it's to a point where it's like, that's kind of fucked up. That's kind of fucked up and I'm, I'm, I, I'm living for it. So that's the first thing that I wanted to say. Secondly, I wanted to uh, just kind of set up our passage a little bit. Um, so as we mentioned, Megan Forrester, she's our main character. Um, she has a husband named Mike and a son named Ethan. And as the back of the book mentioned, they really aren't around for uh, the thick of this book. So let me kind of set the scene. Um, they're at a fair, there's rides, there's laughter, there's like popcorn, the smell of like food, delicious Indian fry bread. Oh my God, I love fry bread. Um, there's good music, you know? And anyway, so they go on this, you know, those big rides that are like those swing sets that they load them and then they go way up into the air and then they spin around and you're like, you know, however high up off the ground. God, those are so scary. Oh, dude, I've done one and I was like, that was enough for me. I don't need to do this again. And I like thrill rides. Don't get me wrong. Um, but anyway, so they went on the swing site, uh, swing set ride. Um, Mike and Ethan did. And Megan is just looking on from the sidelines. And basically, this is what happens. So just keep in mind that I've, again, as usual, I've kind of chopped the passage up um, to include some of the juicy bits. Okay. Um, so here we go. Suddenly... <laughs> I'm going to start that over. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> Suddenly, a metallic groan rose over the sound of the music, loud and discordant, unnatural, close. 
The crowd surrounding the ride let out a collective gasp as the world around Megan seemed to stop. She froze. Something unplanned was happening. But what? A heartbeat later, the answer came. The ride's steel center pole groaned and bent in the middle, lurching several feet to the left. Riders instantly went for being spun horizontally to a diagonal revolution. Mike and Ethan's chair rocketed past, only a yard from the ground. Her husband had his arm protectively wrapped around their crying son. Their look of wide-eyed terror filled her with dread. No, Megan shouted. Please, God, stop! A second before Ethan and Mike collided with the ground, the support chain snapped free. Their undamaged terror hurtled outward at a much lower angle, heart wailing inches over people's head. The dangling chain scythed through the scattering people as they fled toward the food stands. Inside the stand, fire consumed the writhing bodies of her husband and son as their screams blended with the roar of the flames. Their hair flared up like lit matches. Then, as their faces blackened and their bodies contorted in the intense heat, the cries mercifully died away. Her family was gone. Christ. Yeah, dude. So that's pretty fucked up, right? Poor Megan. That's pretty fucking brutal. What would you do? <laughs> I mean, uh, I can't even imagine that. I mean, just literally like your whole world would be shattered right in front of you. Well, and, I, and I, here, and I'll tell you even more. So I couldn't put the whole thing in there because it would have been forever long. But basically, while they were trapped in there, there was a moment where she tried to get him out and she could have and she stuck her hand in there but it was like too hot and she like you know instead of just dealing with it she kind of retracted her hand and then that's when kind of shit hit the fan so she really feels like she could have done more and it's kind of on her so oh, even worse jesus so on that subject even though it's a little bit of a tangent i thought that we might explore some real life thrill ride scenarios that went wrong so, uh, first one that I wanted to mention, because it's uh, just a little bit relevant with the fire, um, is there was a haunted castle at Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey, which is the site of the most deadly theme park accident in history. On May 11th, 1984, that's the year Night Elm Street came out, a fire broke out in the maze-like uh, walk-through attraction, reportedly caused by a 14-year-old boy using a cigarette lighter as a flashlight. The fire ultimately claimed the lives of 29 guests and costume employees who, very much like Ethan and Mike, got all burned up like lit matches. Yeah. Eight of these victims were teenagers, and the tragedy actually led to laws requiring sprinklers, smoke detectors, and other fire prevention methods to be implemented in theme park rides all across the country. Um, so, and it's these are just these scenarios that you think, well, this will never happen to me. This will never happen to my kid. You know what I mean? And you just blindly get on these rides. You have no idea who put them together or how they could possibly malfunction. And it really does make me think twice about getting, especially at like a state fair. Dude, we've been to the Arizona State Fair at least twice. Yep. You really shouldn't go on those rides. I mean, the older I get, the more I'm like theme park rides are a night or not even theme park, uh, like fair rides, especially are just nightmarish. And like some of the things that are like kind of pushing the boundaries of rides. I mean, the older I get, the more I'm like, why do we do this? Well, exactly. And, but I, I trust Disney. They're like the only ones that I trust. I'm like only several, only a, like there's been deaths at Disney, but it's because people are stupid. You know what I mean? It's not because something, I, like, I don't know. Like, I know that wasn't the ride's fault, but still it's like, yeah, you probably should have had some type of fire prevention method uh, in place, you know? Um, so the second example is one that you'll be familiar with. Any guesses? Uh, I think I know where it's going. Yes. The, the decapitation of Caleb Schwab at the Schlitterbahn Water Park water slide, aptly named Varut, or uh, which translates to crazy in German, um, which existed in your home city of Kansas City. Kansas, that's not the Kansas side, though, not the Missouri side, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So just, um, and I've seen this thing from a distance. You showed it to me, but you told me that you actually rode this thing. Yeah. I actually have rode this. Um, it was huge. I mean, it just, I, it was one of those things you do. It's like the slingshot rides, you know what I mean? Where you just, you do them and you're like, wow, I'm good for the rest of time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like fun experience once, glad I lived. Um, this, that slide really did feel crazy. How long did it take you to get to the top? And by the way, the top is, it's 170 feet tall. That's 70 stories, which is higher than Niagara Falls, just for context. Um, yeah, I just remember climbing and climbing and climbing and I was kind of like, wow, 
I mean, you like three or four yeah, times dude, you so. go, oh, I got to be close to the top. And you're like, kind of not. And you go, wow. <laughs> oh, this is the real deal. And so basically this ride drops riders down a near uh, vertical chute at speeds approaching 70 fucking miles an hour, dude. That's freeway speeds. Um, so you go down, up and incline, then down again. And Caleb Schwab uh, lost his life on the raft he was riding went airborne on the rise after the initial drop. Um, so although the ride featured, it had like netting and stuff to keep people from flying out, um, Caleb unfortunately hit a metal support beam and was decapitated. Uh, his head and body landed in the water chute and slid down the rest of the way, coming to a stop at the bottom where Caleb's brother and mother were waiting. So that's really, really gruesome. And I mean, so so when you think of the beginning of this story, um, and while it might sound far-fetched to some, there are many, 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 many examples of people dying in scenarios just like this. I, and there's always these TikTok videos, dude. I've seen people go flying from one of these swings before. They didn't die, but they went flying out of the swing. Um, so just, dude, it just crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and, oh, and by the way, in both of those cases, both of those, uh, theme park tragedies, no one was found criminally liable. So just saying, think twice before you get on a thrill ride or don't let's do move on, um, and get, uh, to some big ass spiders and their victims. So as we have established, Megan's family is dead. Um, she finds herself on a church camping trip six months down the road. She's grieving. She's coming to terms. She's struggling with it as any normal person would. Um, and just, you know, we have a pretty small cast in this book. We have a cast of nine people on this trip, including Megan. Um, so it's not really a huge cast of characters. Uh, it's not Stephen King's The Stand. Um, it's not Game of Thrones. Uh, in addition to Megan and her dead family, we have uh, Pastor Rizzo, who's this elderly, nice pastor guy. I mean, imagine the sweetest old pastor that you've ever known, right? Not the ones who were talking about the Jews burning. Amen. Okay. And then we've got his 20-something daughter, Emma, who seems like a nice enough girl. She's not like an idiot or anything like that, but she's there with her boyfriend whose name is Ryan. And Ryan is kind of like this machismo, like, yo, you know, don't touch my girl. He's like that kind of guy. And then there's this other guy named Paul DeLuca. He's the bus driver slash tour guide, the one who screws up the whole thing, gets him lost in the first place. Then there's his family that doesn't really serve as much purpose other than, well, you know, serve as set up a kill count. Uh, but we have Jim, Marianne, and their grandson, Connor. And then we have another guy named Ricky Vargas. Uh, and Ricky is actually Emma, uh, the pastor's daughter's ex. And he's a little bit of a shady character. So that's our past, our little cast of characters, just so you kind of can reference that uh, as we move along. Um, so it, you know, in a book of small characters, it's it's kind of hard to pick your favorite. So for me, it's kind of a toss up between Vargas and Megan. And they never call him Ricky. They always call him Vargas. Uh, between Vargas and Megan. They're easily the two strongest, most robust characters. Uh, they're the only ones with clear motivations. And they're really the only ones like a, like an actual story arc. Would you, would you ever go, would you ever go on a church camping trip? Um, actually, I've been on a few church camping trips. Oh, so this is actually a thing. Yes. Yep. How many people go to this? Is it like 30 people? Is it nine people? Like what type of people go on these? I've been to one where it was maybe a couple, I mean, a hundred, you know what I mean? Maybe 150. 150? Jesus Christ. I mean, these are like big networks. Like these, like, that's what it was, right? Is a Christian camp? Um, no, it's just like a church. It's just like a church group. And they're like, literally just like, hey, who in this church group wants to go out on this trip? And these are just the people who decided to go. Megan decides to go. So she's trying to move on. I think that she deserves some some kudos for that. You know, that obviously, I think a lot of people would just kill themselves. Um, anyway, uh, and she's being put in a situation where the need to like the need and the will to act to save lives and her own life is super pertinent to her and like everyone else's survival. So, um, and, and like not only that, but she has this element of her that's like Mike and Ethan would, would want me to be happy, which I think is kind of courageous. And I kind of understand that because whenever I'm feeling really down and out about my mom, which today is her birthday, happy birthday, mom. Uh, I'm like, 
my mom would want me to be happy and to move on. So I'm, I'm really relating to that portion, that portion of her, you know what I mean? So in that way, she's really relatable. I don't know that I face quite that big of a tragedy. Uh, losing a parent is one thing, but losing a child is, is another, you know, I just think that that's like a step above that. That being said, uh, you know, my favorite is, is actually not Megan, it's Vargas, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Vargas is like a mysterious dude, okay? So he's only the only character who gets chapters from his point of view other than Megan. So he's like the other main, main character, right? Um, like I mentioned, he's also Emma's ex-boyfriend, so there's this whole like back and forth between him and Ryan, her current boyfriend. And it's kind of, it's totally awkward tacos, man. But from early on, uh, you know, the audience is made aware that Vargas has some ulterior motives for the camping trip. He seems to be obsessed about this bag that he left in the bus. He doesn't take it with him because he doesn't want anybody to find out what he has. But the nice thing about Vargas is he has this constant struggle between basically what he came there to actually do and like what is the right thing to do. Um, so like at one point he even contemplates murder. So I'm like, yeah, this dude's a juicy character with lots of layers. He's dangerous. He's mysterious. He's a little evil, but ultimately he's good at heart. He's like, kind of like Jack Sparrow. Pirate and a good man. Um, so I'm going to give it up for Vargas. Vargas is my dude in this and he's kind of the hero of the story. Uh, not to give too much away. Uh, but if we're talking about least favorite characters here, I'm going to give it to Emma's dude, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan's got to be my least favorite. And he's like super insecure about Vargas's presence, right? Because Vargas totally, you know, gave it to his woman, right? Uh, so he's constantly starting fights. He's totally being defensive. I mean, it just irritates me mostly because it reminds me of of how stupid and jealous I used to be in like my early 20s and like late teens, right? It was disgusting. Did you ever have that type of like that type of behavior? You must have. Oh yeah. I mean, if you're a young man, you ha you have to learn how to like handle those feelings and that's not something you're working on ho at home. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so what was, what was, so for me, there was certainly a defining moment where I was like, Oh, I was rightfully dubbed for this behavior. Um, and I'm talking about you, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you. You broke my heart. It's okay though. We're like friends now and I still adore her. Just so everybody knows, sorry if you can hear like fireworks going on while I'm talking, it's new year's. I mean, it's like a couple days after New Year's, people are in my neighborhood. They just don't even care. They don't care what time it is. They're just going to burst and bust off their fucking fireworks. It really annoys me. I'm, I'm a grumpy. I'm like a grumpy old man about it. It's New Year's. It's, you know, it's like the 12th of the month. <laughs> I know it's the third. Um, so it should be over now, you know, and it's 10 p.m. They should be done now. This it gets dark at six. Do it at seven. You know what I mean? Seven to eight. That's appropriate. Fine. After that, fuck off and die. Um, and speaking of dying, Ryan luckily does die. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Just saying. He gets taken by the spider. And let me tell you, if I were in the forest and this shit happened to me, I would just shit. I would shit in my fucking pants. Uh, and let me tell you what I mean with favorite quote number two. Uh, and I'll preface this again by... Just saying that, you know, they basically drove out there. It was like a five hour drive or something like that. And, you know, they got there and then they hiked into the forest another three hours. And uh, Vargas uh, wants to go back and get his mysterious bag. And he says he has his meds in there. Uh, and basically, since it's nighttime or it's going to be getting nighttime, uh, you know, the group is insistent that he not travel through the woods alone. So a big eye roll for Vargas uh, so that, you know, DeLuca, the guide and, and bus driver ends up going with them. As the scene begins, Vargas and DeLuca are on their way back to the bus uh, when DeLuca spies a deer and watches it uh, with an outdoorsman's adoring eye. Uh, Vargas is in the midst of considering attacking and possibly killing DeLuca. So that way he can take care of business. Um, and literally he's sneaking up behind him and he's like, now's my chance. Uh, but soon serenity melts into chaos when Vargas's ears are perked by a strange noise. From up in the canopy came an odd high pitched hissing sound. It was like nothing he had heard since arriving in these woods. Both men instinctively froze. The noise sounded insect like to Vargas. It reminded him of the creepy sounds he heard when he helped dump a rival gang member's body in a marsh in the Bronx River watershed. The thought of the stiff corpse turned his stomach, the pale white skin with purple blotches where lividity had set in. He was no stone-cold killer, but back then was younger and had assumed he must get his hands dirty to prove himself. 
The corpse was probably a better guy than DeLuca. Vargas took a step toward him. No time like the present. Next time he looks away. The hissing grew louder until it reminded Vargas of the white noise from an old TV tune between channels. Oddly, DeLuca appeared equally confused. Alarmed, even. What's up? Vargas asked. You look like you've seen a ghost. What the heck could be making that racket? DeLuca said. Vargas shrugged. Cicadas? He shook his head. Nope. They're more of a ring than a hiss, and anyway, they're not due for another three years. Okay, so they came out early. Who gives a shit? They don't... A scream cut him off, short and sharp, like that of a distressed animal. Vargas's head snapped toward the buck in time to see its four hooves shoot up into the canopy. Nothing else moved in the forest. So, I chose that passage because it kind of gives you an idea of, like, how everyone is disappearing. Like, this is just what happens. You know, anybody who disappears, they're just standing there and it just gets swooped up before anybody sees what happens. So, that's pretty scary. Um... So I, and I like it, honestly, it really gives me the heebie jeebies. Like, doesn't it freak? Are you scared of spiders? Uh, I mean, yeah, once they're around me, but. Have you ever been bit by a spider? I'll tell you right now, if I had to fuck with those Australia spiders, I don't think I could do it. Oh, uh, camel spiders? All of them. I don't, all of them fucking <laughs> things, dude. There's no, they have no right to look the way they do. I know. I wonder why Australia has so many like more venomous animals per capita. I'm going to ask my Australian friend. I'm talking to you, Leah. Uh, anyway, um, so now that we've got the spider really here into the mix um, and we're starting to kind of see him pop up, I want to talk a little bit about spiders and literature because they're nothing new. Uh, they go all the way back to Greek mythology. Um, you're into mythology, right? I do like mythology, yes. Cool. Then you'll enjoy this. Have you ever heard of the tale of Arachne? Uh, no. So, Arachne is the Greek uh, myth for which the spider is named. Arachne was the daughter of a shepherd who was blessed with great weaving skills, but Arachne refused to give Athena, the goddess of wisdom and apparently weaving, uh, any credit for her innate skills. So, in disguise, Athena challenged her to a weaving contest. And this is very much like, uh, imagine, you know, devil went down to Georgia, right? Athena goes down to Athens, right? Uh... And Athena challenges her to a weaving contest, and Arachne loses. And then after that, uh, Athena sprinkles her with this juice of Akate's herb, uh, and immediately the touch of the dark poison, Arachne's hair falls out. With it goes her nose and her ears. Her head shrinks to the smallest size, and her whole body becomes tiny. Her slender fingers stuck to her sides as legs. Uh, the rest of her is belly, and you know from that body, she still spins a thread as a spider. So, kind of... That's pretty macabre. Sounds like a great thing to write a song about. What can I say? What can I say? And beyond that, uh, you know, we, there's uh, so many great examples of spiders in literature. And I'm not talking like we could go back to more. I mean, there's so many more mythology stories about spiders, I'm sure, and like Norse and other mythologies and stuff like that. But I'm here to talk about like J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. These are like some of the best giant spiders that we've ever gotten. So in, El in Lord of the Rings, it's Shelob. You remember Shelob, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, dude. And then uh, it's Aragog and Harry Potter. Um, they're both large, terrifying, territorial, and like, I don't want to fuck with them. Um, and I Those guess the difference- are also similar in size, right? Is has the spider in the book in terms of size? Yeah, I would say they're pretty similar. I would say like, yeah, I mean- um, Big enough to snatch up a guy for sure. I would say, I think Aragog is the bigger of the two spiders. You know, not that I know, have them, I don't know how really big they are compared to each other, but it's based on like, if you're going based on the screen, you know, the movies, I'm going to say that Aragog yeah. is bigger. So I'm going to say, yeah, he's like Aragog. And then, um, you know, Aragog talks, Shelob doesn't talk. And then also, I don't think he talks. It's been a while since I read the two towers. And then uh, also this, this, this spider obviously doesn't talk and it doesn't have a name. So I think we should, what, what should we name him? Like. Maybe it's a girl. She's a bitch, dude. It's a bitch. It's a. This is a girl spider, dude. Her, her <laughs> name. We should name her Charlotte. Charlotte? Why Charlotte? Charlotte the Harlot, dude. <laughs> okay, I like that. Yeah, she's Charlotte the Harlot. Uh, well, she doesn't really have a name, but she certainly has a presence, um, even when you don't see her. And I mean, just to lend some creepy context, um, I wanted to, like, do a really quick rundown of some spooky spider statistics. So one minute on the clock, please. 
Spider silk of a certain weight is approximately five times stronger than still of the same weight. Spiders will often rebuild their web once a day, regularly eating their old web to regain some of the energy lost while building it. Mm. Spiders have such big brains that sometimes they will ooze in the arachnid's body cavities. In fact, some spiders have central nervous systems that occupy as much as 80% of their bodies. The world's oldest spider lived to be 43. He passed away after retiring in Key West, Florida. He climbed up the water spout, which in Key West is not a spout at all, but a water tornado. I made up everything but the age. Spiders are able to capture and feed on animals as large as bats, and some bats are as fucking huge. Uh, they look like chihuahuas with, with, with wings. Uh, the world's largest spider discovered in Rio Cabro, Venezuela had legs as long as five dollar foot long at Subway. And uh, this is the worst one. Researchers in North Carolina State University analyzed 50 houses and found spiders in every single one and estimate that there are spiders in three out of every four bedrooms in the house. Wow. I mean, crazy facts, you know, but it's always amazing how many spiders you find. There was a, so you probably remember the old trees in my house. We took them down, right? But they, we have these spiders that have the backs that looks like the berries on those trees. So they really take favor to these trees. So we always get like five or six of them because we're the only ones in the neighborhood with it. And this spider could make a web taller than you, dude. Like sometimes you'd walk into it and fully net your whole body. Oh my god! And you could see. Oh, it was the craziest thing. And then fall when there's like <coughs> dude, a lot of gag. dew, and you wake up and there's <laughs> like a huge dew fucking spider web, like in the yard that you could just trap your whole face. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, uh, dude, don't work. you want to get the probe lens on that thing? Oh, we're, it's one of the things we're going to be doing. Okay, like, cool. Getting the probe lens in there, maybe, you know, another bug goes in there. Who knows? Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Spiders are pretty terrifying. And not only that, but like silk is really, I mean, it's just, I guess it makes sense because you think about like Spider-Man, right? I guess that's pretty accurate then. He really probably could swing himself. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, sure. it's like, it's like swinging something five times stronger than still, right? But it's kind of controversial to even say that because only... As far as I know, only Tobey Maguire Spider-Man like self-produced it. Everyone's else is like some kind of scientific like formula to make this web. That's true. Which ones you do you prefer? Smart, you know, smart, uh, smart Spider-Man who makes his own webs, or do you prefer, you know, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man no. who just he he's got okay, all the cool stuff. Why can't his body just make webs, dude? That's the coolest thing. <laughs> hey, do they only come out of your hands? <laughs> come, yeah. come out anywhere else <laughs> he's like oh come on man i know i know uh <laughs> dude is that is that is that your favorite is that your favorite superhero who's your favorite superhero is it um, superman no god oh no. good okay um I, if i had to pick a favorite superhero god you know what i remember liking the green lantern a lot as a kid but then like it just got wrecked every time he gets portrayed um, I think my favorite superhero was probably Batman. You yeah. know, he's just a good dude. One. Batman's and the shit, dude. He's he's dude. dude he's the just shit. the man, dude. He just trains his ass off. That's why I don't like Superman. Superman can just do whatever the fuck he wants, and it doesn't even need. You know what I mean? Oh, he's got one weakness that is from a whole different planet. Okay, big fucking deal. You know? Right. God. Right. He just happened to fly to a planet where he'd be stronger than everything right. else in the damn universe because he's like. Oh, it just so happens your your son gets me harder than any and any star in the whole galaxy. Can you believe it? <laughs> oh, Lois. Um, oh, Lois. But uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know what? I wouldn't mind having Superman to deal with some big ass spiders. That's for sure. That's for sure. I'm saying Batman's coming in with a plan. He's gonna like know more about spiders than you would fucking expect. He's gonna have just the right tools for the damn job. You know what I mean? Like, you want to go in with Spider Man. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, yeah. with Batman. Well, oh, but you know, I struggle because I like Batman, but if you're going to go up with someone who has actual powers, I got to see Spider-Man. And not only that, but there's only one superhero that I feel like is on my level in terms of trivia, and it's got to be Peter Parker. So just saying. Um, now, what, what, now, would you watch a film if Spider-Man f***ed one of these spiders? Okay, I'm going to be cutting that out of the podcast. We're just going to move on. <laughs> okay. <Is it> <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I'd like to move on to our final quote of the evening. And I'd like to, again, preface the passage by saying that at this point, Megan has basically been separated from the majority of the group. She wakes up in a cave wrapped in webs, a la Frodo in the Two Towers, um, or Return of the King, if you're referencing the movies. Um, she's freaked out. She's struggling. And that's when she notices she's not alone. Pastor Rizzo and Emmer are also bound with webs. It was too dark and her sight still too poor to see much beyond Rizzo. The arachnids stood over another cocooned body. The head and shoulder had been cleanly stripped of all their flesh and muscle, making the face unrecognizable. Megan looked down at the lower half of the body, fearing the worst. Emma's hiking pants and boots confirmed it. The arachnids sank its fangs into Emma's upper body, systematically cutting straight lines across her chest, going lower each time, ripping off chunks of flesh and swallowing. In less than a minute, it had opened her rib cage and torn out a lung to gorge upon. Megan had never felt more horrified in her life. Megan, please tell me, Rizzo croaked. Is my Emma safe? Megan realized that the pastor could not see the horrors happening right behind him. She's safe, pastor, Megan lied, fighting back tears. Emma escaped with Ryan a while ago. Thank God. Rizzo mumbled, drooling blood. He tried to smile, but his mouth quickly straightened. He took a final, bubbling breath, and his body relaxed, his suffering finally at an end. Wow. Yeah, so this, this, mm -hmm, this spider is just scarfing up these bitches. Yeah, I love that it's, uh, you know, there's a... This spider is uh it's just a it's just a big spider cuz I think the one from Lord of the Rings is kind of like this demon creature, you know what I mean? Like there's a magic to it. But like the one in Harry Potter and this one are clearly just big ass fucking spiders, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> That's well, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I'm going to say Shelob is not really magical, but I would say Aragog is more magical than Shelob. And Aragog talks, but I, I would say Shelob, actually, I would say Shelob is more like, gives me more vibes for this, for this one, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, Shelob to uh, Charlotte the Harlot. Um, and I, you know what? I almost didn't choose this passage. I almost chose the end of the book, but as I mentioned to you, I've just been toying with myself about like, should I be giving away as much info as I am about spoiler? Like, you know what I mean? We talked about this. I don't really know what to do. I think... I think that we should put a poll up after this podcast goes up and see if people like spoilers, if, if we should avoid them or if we should maybe do a spoiler section and then a non-spoiler section. I don't know, man, but we'll think about it. We'll think about it. What do you think? Um, I think, yeah, I guess it kind of depends on your audience. If your audience is just people who have read these books and want to tune in for the conversation about it, then yeah, keep throwing spoilers. But if your audience is more like looking for new books and they're looking to you for perspective, yeah, I would probably assume we should take them out maybe yeah well we'll, we'll figure it out we'll, we'll go ahead and put up a poll and, and guys let us know what you think um do you want us to split it up maybe into like a spoiler non-spoiler episode or or how do you want us to do that oh and then i also wrote like a little podcast song that we might be debut might be debuting here in the next few weeks when the night is coming along when you're home in bed wearing your So regardless of that, you know, uh, I, I really try to stay, like, stay away from too many spoilers in this one. I, I feel like we didn't get to discuss as much of the actual book as I would have liked. Um, we kind of sprinkled in some fun facts and things like that along the way. Um, but I still want to, I want to give it a final rating. Um, Zach, obviously you haven't read the book, so it's like, you know, on a scale from one to five, how likely are you to read this book? Um, and I think that we should rate it out of, you know, at, uh, zero to five big ass spiders are you reading this or not uh likelihood i'm gonna read this is a three big ass spiders three out of five three big ass spiders okay so we've got shelob two charlotte the harlot what's the name of the third spider 
Um, Aragogans. <laughs> Eric Hoggins? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eric Hoggins. <laughs> Perfect. Eric Hoggins. That's what it sounds like you're saying. <laughs> Eric Hoggins? <laughs> Present. Oh, that's stupid. All right. Perfect. Well, for me, um, after having finished this book, obviously it was a really quick read. You know, I think I read it in like two days. Um, I'll probably give it like, honestly, so I feel like the writing style of this book is a little, like it's not as the prose isn't quite what I would like it to be. It could be prettier. You know what I mean? But in terms of like action packed, fast paced, like page turner, absolutely. So I'll give it, you know, I'll also give it a three. I'll give it a three out of five. Um, I probably would never read it again, but I will continue to read James Murray and Darren Wearmouth because they have a trilogy of books, which is about like, I think like a big gigantic Godzilla like monster that like lives beneath New York. Uh, so I'm like, that kind of sounds interesting. I might have to check that out. Um, so yeah, overall, um, not bad, not bad. Uh, I, I want to also just kind of take a moment and just let everybody know that yours truly is also working on a novel of my own called Rhiannon. Um, and just to kind of sum up, I don't know, Zach, how would you sum up Rhiannon? I, I always called it like a cat lady on steroids. Yeah, definitely cat lady on steroids. Um, <laughs> that's the best way. I mean, it's literally cat lady on catnip here. Okay. Yeah, she is on some, well, it's not, oh shit, hit my headphones. Uh, yeah, she, well, not catnip, but that bitch is on something. She is, this has got to be, it's got to be one of the craziest fucking people I've ever seen. If this person was a real person, they would deserve to die. Just she, saying. I mean, if you can imagine an old woman that you'd at for sure either want to always stay away from or want to physically assault as though she were, you know, a, a random stray cat coming after your pet, that's what you're going to think of this woman because you just want someone to get her. Yeah. If you, if you ever looked at your grandma and wanted to punch her in the face, this is just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, but I, I only bring that up because, you know, you and I had talked about, um, you know, the potentiality of doing a documentary, um, just kind of about the world of, of indie authors and indie publishing since starting this podcast, I've had a lot, a lot of indie authors kind of reach out and, and ask me to read their books and to see if maybe they could come on the podcast to discuss their books. And honestly, it's been like a really cool thing. And, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say I don't want to admit this, but in the past, I I don't feel like I necessarily gave indie writers the shake that they deserved. There's so much talent out there, um, and it's really cool to kind of be in a position to to, to, to showcase some of that talent and, and help, even if it's a small way, help them get a few sales on some of these excellent works. And over the next few months, we will be having a number of um, of indie authors come on and chat about their, their you know, their books and stuff like that. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm saying that because if there's anybody out there who I haven't maybe connected with who hears this and is like an indie author or is involved at all in the indie publishing, um, you know, industry would love for you to reach out uh, to me at ambient spooks at gmail.com, which is kind of the, um, I guess it's the creepy reader podcast email that I use. Uh, and just, you know, if you're interested in, in potentially being interviewed for something like that, please let us know. Um, you know, we want to bring as much awareness as we can to the process and, and just let some of these indie authors shine through. So um, if that's something that anybody out there is interested in doing, please feel free to reach out at ambientspooks at gmail.com. Um, Zach, do you have any other, any other thoughts you would like to? to throw out there before we, before we end this, this thing? I don't think so. I'm kind of mindless at this point. At this point. Yeah. Uh, happy new year, everybody. Um, real quickly, next episode, we'll be descending into the enchanted staircase of, uh, or part of me will be descending down the enchanted staircase of Stephen King's most recent novel. Assuming I get this episode out before he drops another novel, uh, which is, actually pretty likely um book is fairy tale so we'll be talking uh talking about fairy tale until next time keep reading creepers when the night is coming along when you're home